Sit down and shut up. Get the hell off the beach. It's 4.30. You've maximized your tan. Get off the beach. Are you stupid? On topic. On topic. Next question. A thousand things I'll do tonight. Going to dinner with you is about number thousand and one. The rear end's going to get thrown in jail, idiot. <laughs> Either sit down and keep quiet or get out. One or the other. We're done with you. <laughs> That's the Chris Christie. Everybody remembers from back in the day. Basically just telling people what's going on. In 2016, the governor ran for president, and now, three years later, he's the author of the new book, Let Me Finish, detailing his rise in New Jersey politics and his insight into the Trump presidency. Chris Christie joins me now. Governor, I used to get drunk with my friends and watch you on YouTube just lay <laughs> people out. I'm glad I was entertainment when you were drunk. That's good. <laughs> well, you're my entertainment now. I love your show. Well, thank you very much. You have great taste. Now, unlike a lot of the other people that interviewed you, I actually read this thing. I know, and I'm going to be able to tell right away. And I tell I, the people who didn't read it. Well, I skipped the New Jersey part. I went straight to the 2016 campaign. <laughs> okay. All right, I confess. Now, in the campaign, you really went after Marco Rubio hard. I did. You actually, a very famous moment of the campaign was when you got him so flummoxed he started repeating himself in the New Hampshire debate. Let's roll that and then talk about it. But I would add this. Let's dispel with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He is trying to change this country. He wants America to become more like the rest of the world. We don't want to be like the rest of the world. We want to be the United States of America. You see, everybody, I want the people at home to think about this. That's what Washington, D.C. does. The drive-by shot at the beginning with incorrect and incomplete information, and then the memorized 25-second speech that is exactly what his advisors gave him. And the crowd loved it. And then I think he repeated the same line about three more times. Three more times. Yeah. Now, do you guys talk after yeah. that? You guys are friends. Yes. Yeah, we're fine. You know, listen, in fact, after Marco had his debate for his Senate seat then that he ran for reelection for, he called me the next day and he said, by the way, thank you. And I said, well, why? And he said, I did great in my debate last night, and all I was thinking about was what you did to me in February, and I'm never going <laughs> to let anybody do that to me again. So uh, we, you warmed him up. We did. I think, and I think that Marco understood we were competing with each other. We were in direct competition with each other in, in New Hampshire, and I did what I thought I needed to do. And you got some big endorsements in New Hampshire, and your poll numbers really started to rise, and you were really the attack dog for a lot of that primary campaign. Then you dropped out, endorsed Donald Trump. Tell us about the endorsement. You went down to Texas. Texas? Yeah, we went to Fort Worth. Um, I flew down there the night he was having a debate in Houston. I met him in Fort Worth and, and we did the endorsement. And I remember we kept it so quiet, no leaks, that when we walked into that room that you're showing on the air right now, a reporter saw me walk in the room with Trump and said, oh my God. Uh, they were stunned. But here's what I knew. I knew he was going to be the nominee. Because you endorsed him before almost anybody else before did. Before anybody. Before Jeff Sessions. Yes, before anybody. I endorsed him. He was my friend for 15 years at that point. But also, I had campaigned against him. I knew he was going to be the Republican nominee. And my job, as I saw it, was to endorse him and to go in there and make him the best candidate he could be because we did not want Hillary Clinton to be president of the United States. Right. So then you're a big part of the campaign at that point, moving on to the fall and the Access Hollywood tape drops. Yep. What went through your mind when Access Hollywood drops? Oh, listen, I think we were all stunned and worried and concerned. But uh, one of the things I said to the then candidate at the time was, he said, is it over? And I said to him, no, because you're running against the single worst presidential candidate in my lifetime. <laughs> so we got time to recover, but we got to do this the right way. And he went into that debate that Sunday night, and he dealt with the issue, and he really, really performed well in that debate. And that, plus Jim Comey's little, little letter, I think turned momentum, and, and now we have Donald Trump as president. That's right. Now, so there's some controversy about you in that second debate. There's people in the campaign that say Chris Christie had the opportunity to fly on the jet with the team and go to that debate in Houston, and you decided that morning maybe not to go, and people thought that was a little disloyal. Yeah. Well, listen, that's uh, Steve Bannon, who just making stuff up, telling me if either you're on the plane or you're off the team, it's typical Steve drama that was completely made up. Um, I made it really clear. I called that morning and said, listen, I'm the only elected official here. And you haven't yet answered these questions. And if I go there, they're going to be all over me to answer these questions. I want you to answer them first. Same reason I didn't go on Sunday morning shows that Sunday before the debate. And the president knew full well why I wasn't going. 
Um, and that night, after the debate was over, 10 minutes after it was over, he called me and he said, I won the debate because of you. You're the best campaign debate prepper I've ever seen. We still run debate prep for debate number three. So this whole idea that I was off the team, I was there, and then on election night, I was in his apartment with he and Melania and Barron and the rest of the family watching election returns. So um, another Steve Bannon fiction. Okay, and that was a great night, the, that election night. It was an amazing night. Amazing historic No one comeback. thought it, Jesse. No one thought it was going to happen when the exit polls came in at 5.30, showing Hillary Clinton was going to win 350 electoral votes. Believe me, down the street at Trump Tower, there was a lot of consternation. But, when it, but it made it only better when those returns came in and it went our way. And uh, he was one very happy man that night. You were in the running for, I believe it was attorney general and maybe another cabinet position. And you were also in charge of the transition. Now Chris Christie's out writing books. He's not in the White House at all. What happened? Well, um, I was in the running for vice president. It came down to me and Mike Pence, and he selected uh, Governor Pence. And, and I love Governor Pence, and I think he was a good choice. Mm -hmm. Um, I was then in the running for attorney general. He picked Jeff Sessions. But oh, in, imagine if Chris Christie had been AG. There would be no Bob Mueller. No. Oh. If Chris Christie was AG. Wow. That you can, that you can be sure of. And, and on the transition stuff, two days after the election, as, as I write in the book, Steve Bannon called me in and fired me as chairman of the transition. And when I, I knew it wasn't his doing, and I said to him, whose decision was this? I thought perhaps it was the president elects, and I wanted to talk to him directly. And he finally said to me, no. Um, as he referred to him, he said it was the kid, referring to Jared Kushner. And he mm -hmm. said, it's the kid, he's been taking an axe to your head ever since I got here with the boss, ancient bitterness. And so, you know, this goes back to, as I detail in the book, the time in 2004 when I prosecuted Jared's father. Yeah, I'd be pretty mad too. Well, I, you know, I'm sure you would be at the time, but then 12 years later, Jesse, once you knew that your father had committed those crimes, that your father had pled guilty, not been found guilty, admitted to the crimes. What else was I supposed to do as a prosecutor? Turn my head and walk away? I understand. I took an oath. And so, uh, you know, in the end, also, we're supposed to be serving the president. Right. And by throwing me out and throwing the entire six months of transition work out, the president's still attempting to recover from that with a lot of empty desks and a lot of people who got picked for jobs like Mike Flynn and Tom Price and others who had no business being there and served the president poorly. Well, that would have been a lot of fun having you as AG, telling people to sit down and shut up in the press corps. That would have been... Something. You know what happened, too, Jesse. <laughs> That's right. All right, Governor, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it.